and we are live. So, another edition of You've Got Mail with a wonderful children's author, um, not only prolific and award winning, but you seem to be connecting everything, all the dots, STEM, teaching little babies about angular momentum on Hanukkah. What's that all about? Well, if you want to know, then stay with us because we have here Ruth Bernstein Spiral. Yes. You can you can say hi, Ruth. Oh, hi. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, and we we always start out with the jingle. Mm -hmm. um, not jingle bells, but jingle mells. Mm -hmm. And um, so, if you're ready, we will begin. Are you ready? I'm ready. Is the world ready? They are ready. Get a chair, grab a seat, I will sweep you off your feet. We move, we groove, you got mail. Ease your legs, rest a while, all you gotta do is smile. We're swell, can't you tell you got mail? When the show begins, you better hold on real tight. For before you know it, you'll be high as a kite. Take a break, settle down, we're the only show in town. Yes, I wrote, don't you know you got mail? Give it up, don't think twice, we're a hurricane on ice. What the hell, get a bell, ring a bell, show and tell. Man will sell, give a smell, you got Mel. You've got Mel. And Mel has the incredible Ruth Bernstein Spiral. Yes. Uh, which was probably originally Ruth Bernstein Spiral. <laughs> so, so Ruth, first of all, let's start with the important stuff. Yes. You have a series of baby books coming out. Yes, I do. Well, yes, they're mostly out already. Um, so unbelievably, this October, it will be the fifth anniversary of the first book coming out. And by the end of this year, there will be 21 books. <laughs> so I've been, I've been quite busy. Yes. Yeah. So the, the first one in the series that came out was Aerospace Engineering. Read that one. And, yes. And there was um, Quarks, which is all about particles. There was Quantum Physics and Thermodynamics, which is about getting our energy from the sun. Um, one of them, well, the two most popular ones right now are Aerospace Engineering and Coding. Um, and then we went into the, and I know Dr. Mel, you will be very interested in this, we went into the five senses. So we have smell and taste and hearing and sight and touch. Um, and then also this last year, we took a foray into politics with political science right here behind me. So we started out with <clears throat> democracy, which is all about elections and election day and how we vote and why we vote and why it's important to vote. And then I realized that there was so much more of that story to tell. And I proposed doing one book for each branch of the three, or the three, one book for each of the three branches of government that we have here in the US. And so there's one on Congress, one on the judicial branch, and one on the presidency. Um, and <laughs> and this, this is all, these are all board books. These are all board books, yes. So like starting at two, it's, it's kind of insidious to teach two-year-olds about all these things. So here, here's my philosophy, okay? I am not trying to teach, well, let me, I'll, should I begin at the beginning where this idea came from? Yeah. Okay, so in, in 2010, there was an article in the New York Times about how picture book sales were down and they were attributing this to the fact that parents were bypassing picture books for their very small children in favor of what they thought was more sophisticated reading material. So they were reading, you know, Harry Potter to their two-year-olds. And I was with some, yeah, right? And I was with some writer friends and we were talking about it and I said, you know, what do these parents want? Like quantum physics for babies? And when I said it, it was really just kind of a joke, but I started to think about it and I thought, well, what if I did something like that? What would it look like? And before I even started doing any writing, 
I did about a year's worth of research into child development because I felt like if I was going to write these books, I wanted to make sure that they had some value to them. I didn't want it to be a joke, like, oh, ha ha, here's a book on quantum physics for your baby. Here's a funny, you know, baby shower present. I wanted it to have some value. So I did a lot of research and then I started doing research into the science as well. And what I decided to do was take something at the very beginning that's familiar to a small child. So for example, we go to the park and we see birds, right? And birds can fly. How does a bird fly? Wait, I'm getting there. Oh, she I has, read this book. She has wings. And you know, I learned right. something from this book. Well, that's the thing. But I wanted to make a very concave. Right. It's it has to do with the shape of the wings. And and so parents enjoy them because they do learn a little bit. But my, what I wanted to do was just show small children that science is everywhere. It's all around us. And it explains so many of the things that we do and see every day. You know, parents have little ones that are, they sit in the high chair and they're dropping the Cheerios on the floor and watching them fall. That's gravity. And there's actually been some research, I think it was out of Johns Hopkins that um, showed that babies as young as I think nine months old understand the physics that when you drop something, it's not going to hover in the air. They know it's going to fall. They understand that. So when they are shown something that's hovering in the air, they appear very surprised. So they are capable of understanding some of these ideas. And what I did was I wrote them at, at multiple levels so that you know, with, with an infant, they're not going to understand everything, but they understand, they're learning the rhythm of the language. They're learning what a sentence sounds like and what words sound like. And, and so you can still say, Ruth, oh, look, you, you don't have to apologize to me. I think it's wonderful. No, I'm just explaining um, how it's, they're not just for babies. They could be for toddlers, for, they're for preschool, they're for older. But they I read it and I learned stuff. Okay, well, that's wonderful. You're on the show. I think you're terrific. But most importantly, did you learn anything here? <laughs> I, I don't have that book. I'm going to have to buy it. Oh, I will have to. Yes, I'll have to make sure you get is, this. Is it so, scratch and sniff? <laughs> that would have been nice. <laughs> My that last been nice. scratch and sniff. You should ask them to make an edition. That would be lovely. Or you can scratch it and sniff it. That, that would be wonderful. What a good yeah. idea. We can speak later. Okay. Uh, and, and, the, and you were talking about baby showers. Mm -hmm. So here's another idea for a book. Okay. Showers for baby showers. Like uh, meteorology, perhaps? Yeah. I have to tell you, I have a very long list of topics that <laughs> I am really excited to do. And I get emails from people all the time saying, I love your books. Could you please do a book on this? Could you please do a book on this? And then I also have experts that, that send me emails and say, well, I'm an expert on this topic and I would be happy to work with you on blah, blah, blah. And I should mention that for every book, the text and the illustrations are reviewed by experts in the field. Um, and so I have one uh, gentleman who I met at a writing workshop at Jane Yolen's house. His name is Dr. Fred Bortz and he's a retired physicist and he reviews most of the books. He reviews both the text and the illustrations. And then when it's a topic that's not necessarily in his wheelhouse, I will bring somebody else in because I wanna make sure that these are completely accurate and correct because I know if they aren't, I will get lots more emails and people will tell me about that. So, so listen, you have a, a joke turned into a hugely successful career. Okay, I'll, but, I'll, I'll take no, that. <laughs> I, 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 this is what I teach my students. You know, start yes. with something that's either a mistake or something odd and run with it. You are, you are my poster girl of the month. Okay. But okay. now I, I want to take you back to the very beginning of Ruth. Yes. Uh, and uh, tell us about your life, your babyhood. Gosh, I don't know. It's not all that exciting. Um, I'm from Chicago. I've always lived in the sh in Chicago, in the Chicago area. I'm in the suburbs now. Um, I am an, was an, I'm an only child, and um, don't I don't have a big family. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois. And oh, 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 way ahead of way ahead of me. Oh, okay. What do you like as a little girl? 
Well, you know, I spent a lot of time by myself because my mother was always working. She was a single mom. What and did she do? She, well, so my mother was in the catering business. She was actually in kosher catering. Kosher she, catering. Yes, yes, yes. She started out um, as a secretary in a hotel and worked her way up and she became an executive with Hyatt Hotels and sort of an expert in kosher catering. And she would do all the big events, all the um, uh, big uh, fundraisers and uh, and she has like a wall of pictures of all the dignitaries and people that she met doing doing different uh, parties and events. Well, they, they, She's she's with us, I hope. Yes, thank God. Yes. What's her name? Her name is Anne Bernstein. Anne. Yes. Listen, I you know, I, I need her. You're gonna you're gonna plot now because I need your mom as my expert. I've just written a children's manuscript. Yes. You know, I write children's books, but I'm much less successful than you are. I've written a children's manuscript about two mice who live in a synagogue. Okay. And, and about their caterer. Okay. Whose name is Mrs. Zissel, but I can change it <laughs> to Mrs. Bernstein. Okay. Okay. But I, maybe I can send her the manuscript to check the veracity. She would be more than happy to read it for you, I'm sure. And there's a lot of Yiddish in it. Does she speak Yiddish? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I lucked out today. You sure did. <laughs> I'm sending you that manuscript. You'll enjoy I, it. I'm sure she would be happy to read that. Yes. Ah. So, uh, so anyway, I was, um, I was alone a lot. And so I think I developed a, a joy for reading. I remember we would every Saturday or Sunday, we would take the bus to the public library and check out a stack of books and bring them home. And so I really developed a joy for, for reading. I wasn't as, as a very young child. What were your favorite books, picture books? Um, oh, as a young child. Well, what do I remember? I mean, that was a long time ago. And mm, no, a long time ago. You know, yeah. we didn't have this variety of picture books that kids do now. You know what I'm saying? I, I just I I remember um what did I like? Like the bees like Ramona, I remember. And I was really a big, I mean, as I got older, I was a really big Judy Bloom fan. I remember always going to the library and going to that shelf to see if there was anything new that was out, the excitement when something was brand new. Um, I, you know, I was, I was a big Curious George fan. I do remember reading, reading Curious George and I had a lot of those books. The man with the yellow hat. <laughs> what about Madeline and Ludwig Bemelmans? I don't really, I mean, I kind of remember that from my childhood, but I don't think I was like a big fan of that. I really That's don't. Okay. You know That's what okay. I used to read and I remember, I honestly remember learning to read was from the comics in the paper. Like I remember Nancy and Family Circus and all those. I remember reading those when we would get the newspaper and I, I would save them and go back and reread them again. So, and I remember learning to read. There was a program that was in the newspaper. And I remember sitting down with my mother, you know, I, I can't remember how often it came out, but it was at least once, once or twice a week. And we would sit down and we would go through this program. I think it was like a phonics program. And I remember learning to read through the newspaper. You're a poster girl for comic books, right? Yes, exactly. Listen, you know, we're, we're really getting to the uh, to the real Ruth behind the Ruth here. I feel okay. like I, I feel like I'm going to owe you a, a therapy fee at the end of this. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't charge. Okay, well that's good. <laughs> this, this is actually my therapist told me to interview other people. Ah, well, you need to have one of those signs like on the oh peanuts. That was a big one on peanuts. The doctor is in. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite peanuts one and i've actually written i've actually written a story like this uh is remember every fall sally used to convince uh, peanuts uh charlie charlie brown that she would hold the football for him and this year she would really hold it yes never did that had a big effect on me never did. Uh, I, you can so you, see charlie brown you were mistrusting of people then and and, and rightfully so <laughs> so so okay so so you grew up as a child with books yes and uh in high school yes i went to high school <laughs> <laughs> what were you like in high school um 
what was I like? I don't, I mean, I wasn't, um, I wasn't like a stellar student. I was a good student, but I didn't like really push myself uh, as much as I could have. Um, I wore, I like to work. I sold shoes, which was, I don't know. I enjoyed it. Um, I you hung out shoes as a high school student. I did at the mall. I sold shoes. I made a lot of money selling shoes. It was incredible. I mean, I made, I worked on commission and it was like 10% commission or something crazy. And I lived in a, you know, affluent suburb and I made a lot of money selling shoes just a couple days a week. So that was kind of fun. Um, what did I, do? I mean, I don't really, I, my freshman year, I think I was on the debate team and um, I realized I didn't really love it. It was, it was, I don't know, it was too, there were, there were other schools that they had that as a class. So the kids were really, and ours was just kind of like an after school thing. So I don't, I didn't feel as prepared as I would have liked to have been. And we didn't win any of our debates. So <laughs> I gave up on that. And um, yeah, I, oh, I went to theater camp. There's something for you. Not because I was all that interested in theater, but because that's where my friends were going. And I went and, you know, we would do shows each summer. And I think I learned, you know, a little bit about um, not being shy and, and being able to, to perform and being comfortable in front of. What, what shows did you do? Well, let's see. I remember I was in Fiddler on the Roof. And it was a it was a great program where the roles would be split, so there would be you know there would be um, Golda one and Golda two, and then in um, we did like uh, South Pacific you know there would be they would split the roles so that everyone would have a chance for a main starring role, which was really nice, and then you didn't have to remember all the lines for the entire show. So um, I, we did. Ah, so you was like, really fun you, was it you like the Golda in the second act, right? So whoever wore that particular dress, that was Golda. You know what I mean? We would just change costumes. So that's incredible. But, so were you Golda? I was. Yes, I was. In in yes, and then I remember we did um, how to succeed in business without really trying, which was kind of fun. We did South Pacific. I love yeah, South I know, Pacific. I know all the show tunes because that's what we would do at night. We would just sing all the show tunes. I, I love show tunes. Can you <laughs> sing one? Oh, let's see. Um, oh, I, I'm on the spot here. Name. Okay. Uh, let's see. My therapist told me to put that the man on. right out of my hair. I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair. I'm going to wash that man right. And out of send my him on his and way. And send him on his way. There you go. There's one. <laughs> That's wonderful. How's that? Was that good? Thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great start. We'll do another one at the end of the show. Okay. Okay. So, so um, you were theatrical and then you went to university, of course. Yes, I went to the University of Illinois and I studied advertising and then I worked in advertising uh, for a few years. And then while I was working, I went back to school. This is interesting. I worked in, I was in uh, broadcast production. So we were producing TV and radio commercials and for local accounts. And at one point I decided I wanted to go to graduate school. And in one hand, I had an application for uh, business school. And in the other hand, I had an application for NYU film school, thinking I might want to get into direct directing and, and producing. And then I kind of shook out of it and realized that I couldn't really afford to go to New York and live there and study film. So I went to business school and I got an MBA uh, at night while I was working. And um, yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> that was my choice. That was the path I went down. You're a children's writer with an MBA. There aren't very many of those, but- I know, I mean, I can't. How However, last I will, yeah. yes. Oh, I will say, you know, what's really helped me immensely is my advertising background because yeah. I learned how to write tight, right? If you're writing an ad or you're writing a 30 second commercial, you have to, I mean, seriously, if you watch like a commercial or something, there's a beginning and a middle and an end. That's like a 30 second story right there. Ruth, this is incredible. I've interviewed 120 people and my last interviewee, yes. Joyce Lappin, also a successful children's writer, also writing uh -huh. about STEM and rockets and stuff. Um, uh -huh. she, 
I will introduce you to her. She was in advertising for 15 years. No I'm way. having like a deja vu all over again. That is weird. Yeah, that is wow. unbelievable. You know, who was in advertising was Amy Krause Rosenthal. I met her at a couple of functions and we also kind of shared that similarity too. I think that there, there really is a, a similar. And then I also was, um, well, this is getting a little ahead of myself, but I was also a freelance writer for magazines. So yeah. after I stopped, when I, after I got married and had my two daughters, um, I was staying at home and I was like, after a couple of years, I was like, I need to do something. Like my brain is just turning to mush. I need a something. And I took a couple of classes, one class in writing for children and one class in magazine writing. And I ended up having a really nice side gig uh, doing freelance writing, mostly for Family Fun magazine, and that was also um, I would I would be I was doing like toy reviews and, and book reviews, um, and that was another like my editor would say, okay, can you do a review on this particular item, and it needs to be twenty four words. <laughs> That's all you have space for is twenty four words. So I would really have to work at writing very tight. So I feel like a lot, you know, we all come to to where we are now, and we've got. Um, a history and we have experiences and that all sort of feeds into what our skills are and what our interests are now. That's why this inter these interviews that I do are so much fun because you see as a prolific traditional published author, mm -hmm. you are, let's say maybe one out of a hundred thousand aspiring writers. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe one in several thousand gets a book deal. Mm -hmm. and most have one book deal or maybe two and you have literally dozens of books cooking and well, that you're very like you're in the in the stratosphere now here's well, another baby book for you it, it, yeah. so I mean, so my, my my the people watching the show uh -huh. want to know what the what the secrets what are ruth's secrets for making it all the way to the stratosphere okay so here's here are my secrets are you listening before that, I want to find out how you broke in. How did you get into okay. to writing these children's books? Okay, so I took a, a class I, in writing for children. It was with Carolyn Crimmy, who's also a wonderful children's author. And when I finished the class, she connected me with a writing group with whom I am still meeting. And I've, we've been, I've been with them for about for 20 years now. And they were together even before I joined them. So I've been with the same group of ladies for 20 years. Um, and the first, so the first picture book manuscript that I wrote, I really, you know, I brought it to them and they thought it was great and they gave me some you know critique on it and I saw I joined SCBWI and I decided that I was going to go to the annual conference in um, Los Angeles and you could pay to have a manuscript critique at that so I did that went with my manuscript that I'd written and the I was kind of disappointed at the time because you know you want to have an editor or an agent doing your critique for you and I had an author and when I looked her up she only had one book out and I was like what is she gonna know well it turned out that she had one book that was out and she had like eight more that were in the pipeline about to be published and she had just quit her job as an attorney to focus on writing full-time and her name is Linda Ashman she is also a phenomenal writer very well and yes and at the end of our meeting I said well what do you think I should do with this and she goes well you could send it to my editor and use my name so her editor turned out to be the publisher of Dutton Children's Books, and I sent my manuscript to her and she passed along to her assistant. We went back and forth on revisions for a year. I got a revision letter back. It was like two pages long. And I spent a lot of time going back and forth and working on it. And so that was my first picture book sale. And it was the, okay, I, I normally don't talk about this because people get very angry with me, but it was the first manuscript that I wrote and finished. It was the first manuscript that I ever submitted. And it was the first editor that I submitted it to was the one who ended up buying it from me. I'm not going to get angry this, with you. That was this book right here. It's called Lester Fizz Bubblegum Artist, mm -hmm. which is about a boy who blows bubbles in the shape of art. And unfortunately, it came out in 2008 in the 
fall, which was when the bottom dropped out of the economy and publishing and things just, it really didn't sell very well, but it never quite got a foothold. The uh, editor that I had been working with left right before it came out. It was just kind of doomed from the start. So after about a year and a half, it went out of print. It was very discouraging. And, but I kept writing, you know, I kept working at it. And um, then I didn't, that was, so that was in 2008 when it came out. And I did not sell the, my next book, which was uh, the Baby Love Science series. I sold that in, was that 2012 or 13? Well, no, it must have been 2014 because it came out in 16. Yeah, so I sold that. Into, so it, it was a long time in between sales. It was a long time, but I, you know, but that was the whole time that I was writing, doing the, uh, manu the um, magazine freelance writing. So I was working at that. I was writing a bunch of stories that were published in Chicken Soup for the Soul books. So I, I still had a lot going on writing wise, but um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a long, long gap in the middle there. So just because I was, I had sort of had that lucky first break, you know, it wasn't like it was an automatic. Hey, Ruth, it's not, it wasn't lucky. You had all these years <laughs> of experience writing. You wrote a great manuscript. You, you had it critiqued. You so went what, to SBBWI, you ticked all the right boxes. Well, so what is it that the Deepak Chopra says? It's preparedness meets opportunity. And that's, yeah. what, we call, that's what we call good luck. Is yeah, when but I mean, you, you paid for that opportunity. It was like $40 or something to <laughs> right. have a one-on-one. -on -one. Now it's like $100. Is it? Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I'm doing it for the first time this year. Okay. It's def yeah, definitely worth definitely worthwhile. I, I like I I really um, I'm I'm not going to be angry with you because I'm super proud of you. Well, thank and it, you. It, it it happened to me a few times in my career as a scientist, yes. which brings me to my next question. I might be angry with you because you're writing all these books on science and you're not a scientist. Should I be angry with you? <laughs> so I'm a scientist and I cannot sell my my book about bacteria. So you know. Well, so it's interesting because don't write a book about bacteria, please. <laughs> so it's interesting because no, I'm not a scientist, but I do enjoy doing research and I like learning about new things. And there's that whole philosophy that you may have heard of, which is like the curse of knowledge, they call it, meaning if you are if you are knowledgeable in a subject and you understand it really well, sometimes it's more difficult to explain it to somebody else because you don't know what they don't know. And it's you it's so it's it's difficult. So for me, I'm almost coming it to it from the same um, perspective in that I don't know anything about smell or smell molecules or how our nose works or how that you know connects to our brain. So when I do the research, I'm learning about it. And so I can pick out what I think are the most important points because there could only be a few, it's only 10 spreads in the book. And then of course, that's why it's important to have the expert reviewer because I can only learn so much, but that does not compare to someone who's had a career of, of learning and expertise in a topic. And I acknowledge that. So that's why it's important for me to sort of boil it down, distill the topic into what the, the most important points are, and then also have somebody who's an expert in the field look it over just to make sure that I, I think, the way I I'm think, explaining I think it is correct. Nothing short of magnificent. Oh, and I thanks. read somewhere that you've sold over half a million books. Yeah. And, and, that's, that, well, a, and that's, that's a, a lot more books than shoes. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yes. So that's that's in the US. I think it's actually closing in on like 600,000. This is all for all of them combined. But then they've also been translated into 10 different languages. And so they're being, you know, they're being sold in other countries. And I don't really get good information about the specific no sales numbers for those books. Mm -hmm. But um, so I don't even know, but they are, they're very popular in China and they're popular in Poland. What about <laughs> Israel? I would love, see what, I mean, the way it works is a foreign publisher will buy the rights to translate it and publish it. 
fit in their language and in their country. So I don't really have much control over what languages they end up in. It's just a matter of where my publisher is able to sell those rights. I would love, especially with Israel being so, you know, so much at the forefront of technology and science, I would yeah, think Ruth, that- I, they, I will they, speak to my publisher. Please I, do. Yeah, they, but they don't know that they're my publisher yet. Oh, okay, got it, okay. I'm having well, like a, some little flirtatious thing oh. going. Okay, well, so, you know, you know gotta close I, the deal. I, I, we're, we're Jewish, so I would say keep your fingers crossed, but whatever Jews do, it's analogous. <laughs> um, so, say a bracha. A bracha. <laughs> bracha and mazel. So, um, Ruth, uh, now comes the time mm -hmm. for you to share your wisdom for free with the masses. What are your best tips? <clears throat> what are my best tips? Oh gosh. I wouldn't ask him oil that question, but I'm asking you. Oh, oh that's bad. That's bad. Sorry. So let's see. My best tips would be, um, well, first of all, read, 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 read. Read everything, especially in the genre that you hope to be writing in. Just you have to be familiar with what else is out there read you know publishers weekly and read all the reviews i like reading the reviews of other books because that tells me how they're being critically uh reviewed and analyzed and what's important and um i'm i i also like to be connected with um educators on twitter and instagram to see what's what's going on in, in their world and what's important to them and what they respond to. Um, I like, you know, obviously it's not possible now, but I really liked getting out um, and going to other, to events at, at bookstores and libraries. Even when I wasn't published, I would go to events at my local bookstore and I would meet other authors. I would see how they would do story times and how they would do readings um, and how they would interact with people who came and talk to them. I remember I, I went with a friend, Richard Peck came to a bookstore near us. And I sat there in the front row, just like mesmerized. It was like having a, an hour long masterclass with him. He was just talking about his books and his writing. And I've yeah, gone to see Mem Fox and I've gone to see, I mean, whenever there is somebody um, in your field, even in not your field, you know, that's another point. So I'll finish that thought. So, you know, go when, whenever there's that opportunity to see somebody um, who writes the type of thing that you are writing, go listen to them. If, if, they're on, if they're doing an interview with Dr. Mel on Facebook, listen to that interview, follow them on social media if that's where, they're, where they are. But I also like to explore things that are completely new to me because that's the only way I'm going to find out uh, new ideas and, and things that I might be interested in learning about. I just, I never want to stop learning about new things and I might know something really well, but then that tells me, okay, I know all about this. That means I need to go find something else to learn about. This is what I teach my students. <clears throat> I call it thinking between boxes. Ooh. Learn, learn something that's irrelevant. Yes. And then discover the relevance. Well, and that's also like a, you know, a, a brainstorming technique is taking two things that seem very opposite and putting them together. So mm. for example, science and babies. What happens when you bring those two things together, right? Um, you know, I also, I didn't really mention, I've got this other series yeah. made by Maxine. Yeah. And this actually came about from an article that I had been writing in Family Fun magazine, which was about how parents could bring, this was at the very beginning when STEM was, was new, but it was about how parents could incorporate STEM activities at home and books and toys and puzzles. And I learned about um, makers and maker spaces and all the cool things that they were doing. This was when the, we didn't have 3D printers in houses and libraries and there weren't maker spaces in classrooms. This was people <clears throat> building things in their garages. This was way back in like 2012, 2013. And I thought about, well, you know, what would this look like from a child's point of view? And um, so that's where this came from. So this is about a girl who likes to tinker and hack and build things and come up with contraptions and solve problems in her in her own unique way. Um, but it,
again, that was something where I was assigned an article to write and I just kind of went down the rabbit hole and research and I discovered this whole other sphere and it just, it became interesting to me. So that's amazing. So what was your think, what was the think of between the boxes, did you say? Between boxes, I'll send you something. Okay. I saw another quote somewhere. It said, um, think outside, no boxes required. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> No, it's funny, like when you said, um, you know, I consult with people in the field, mm -hmm. right? So I thought about standing in the field and having somebody come and consult with me on something. There you go. Um, yeah. yeah, but okay, so these are really good tips. Um, how do, one of the things people ask me is how do you come up with ideas? Mm -hmm. um, I have more ideas that I can write about. I have other challenges, but I'm never short of ideas. Mm -hmm. What do you tell writers who don't mm -hmm. have ideas that they shouldn't write? Well, I don't think I've ever actually come up with an idea. I think it's more that I recognize them and I capture them. So everywhere I am, I have these low tech, I have notebooks everywhere. And I I'm love always, this. I love I, this. I'm always I'm writing. I'm having so much fun in this interview. Oh, good. So yeah, I, you know, and this is something I talk about in school visits with kids actually, because there's nothing worse than saying, oh, I need to write about something. What am I gonna write about? And thinking that that does not work. What works is going out for a walk and seeing something, um, you know, a bird in a tree and then saying, hmm, how can I incorporate that into something that I'm writing? Oh, here's the story about a bird, right? and you know spending time with your family at the holidays playing dreidel well, I, listen i i love that that is brilliant you know, when you when you spin the dreidel well how how does that spin and why what makes it fall down right your momentum exactly and friction you introduced three physical principles in a 10 spread board book but here's the thing you should be a, a professor of physics at Stanford. Okay, I will take an honorary professor. Yes. So, but but to me, it's all about going out into the world and having experiences, and then asking questions and being observant and looking around. You know, this one. Well, when you plug the light in, what? How does electricity work? And how does it make the light bulb go on? And where does it come from? Right. I mean, kids have questions. And we all have, I think that, 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 that's a great book too, but it's Thank about you. Christmas. My, my parents would never have bought me so a here, book about Christmas. So here's the thing. And this was a conversation that I had with my editors. I said, I don't want these to be really having a religious element to them, but I want them to be set in the context of the holiday. And I want them to be, I want this to be a book that I would feel comfortable having in my home as a Jew. You have a brilliant double spread there where you said not like, like of all the brilliant stuff you sent me, I love that double spread. Can you show it? Yes. Not Can you all, read it for the, uh, for the I challenged people? Not all baby's friends celebrate Christmas, but they can help her decorate the tree. Baby loves Christmas. And we have her Jewish friend and you know, there's the Christmas baby, and here's some other babies that will show up in future books. Wink, wink. And exactly. then I have the same one in here, mm -hmm. where you know families celebrate Hanukkah in different ways. They may light the menorah, have special treats, exchange presents. Not all babies' friends celebrate Hanukkah, but they can spin the dreidel, right? And here they are all together again. It's, it's so brilliant. Yeah, so, no, so I, I wanted these to be books that um, just gave a, you know, what is Hanukkah? A, a, a holiday that celebrates a miracle. And it's very, it's very basic. So I wanted to make sure that these weren't religious books, but they were books that follow the same science idea, but just take place within the context of the holiday. So these oh, yeah. two. Yes, sorry, Ruth. These were coming out in August, just in time. Hanukkah is very early this year. It's like around Thanksgiving. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and then I, I had a sneak peek at them and they're great. Yeah, thank you. And, and I then, want to tell you something. Yes. If I may. Yes. This is like a case of art imitating life. Because okay. one, one of my sisters, I won't mention which, um, used to sneak over to the neighbor's house on Christmas and help them decorate the tree. And she never told us, like, for many years. So I'm but, reading this and I say, oh, my goodness. But there's nothing wrong with that. And I feel like the more that we understand one another and the more that we can join in and help celebrate holidays with each other, that's kind of what we need, right? Rather than this is my holiday, this is your holiday. It's, oh, how can I bring a friend, you know, to sit at our table for Passover or, you know, whatever the celebrations may be. But what the world needs now is uh, angular momentum. Right, exactly. If we could just all play dreidel together, all the problems you know, you know, in the world would be my solved, problem right? With Zoom, my problem with Zoom <laughs> is that I, I can't, I'm not sitting with you. I, I want to have a coffee with you. <laughs> I want to spend a day with you in Chicago. Here's coffee. <laughs> this has been a remarkable uh, interview. And you are oh. one remarkable lady. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. I'm just me. And, no, but I mean, you know how hard it is to be me? <laughs> and no, I don't. <laughs> my last question before I remind you about the show tunes is um what you do you write i have this theory i'm not a psychologist but i have this theory that people end up writing books for the age that they have unfinished business at Ooh, that's interesting i i always write with my five-year-old honestly i feel like Oh, you know, it kind of froze there. Did you have a question there about unfinished business? No, I said I, I, I when I write for, for children, yes, my, my good stories are written together with my five year old me. OK, that's when I'm truest to being me. When I write for an older age, they're not so good. Um, and then I realized maybe other writers, you know, why do you write for, for young children? I, I, I'm for sure stuck there. Well, first of all, I feel like I do not, everyone, everyone keeps asking me if I'm going to be writing like a chapter book or anything. I don't feel like I have the attention span to write something that long. I know that it, that's, that's a really long process. I really like the beginning, middle, end. I like being, I like writing tight and just packing as much as possible in there. I don't know about the unfinished business part, although I do feel like I wish that I had had these books when I were younger, when I was younger, because I was not, I wasn't a science kid, but I don't think it's because I didn't have an interest in science. I, I think it's because science was not presented in a way that was understandable and meaningful to me. So what I'm Bruce, trying to do- so significant. What you're saying so what is I'm trying you to do is you wish you had exactly. when you were in kindergarten. Yeah, because I think if I had learned about science in a way that related it to the real world, then I might have had more interest and more curiosity about it. But when you look at science and its facts and formulas and doing experiment, it just, it didn't really have meaning to me. But I think that what I'm trying to do here is just show children that science explains everything that's around us. And when you go down the slide at the park, that's gravity, right? And when you are growing a plant, that's photosynthesis. And they're, you know, learning about all the little things and all the things, you know, within our bodies that help make us, um, you know, like how, you know, how do we hear? Like I'd always wondered, like what is sound? I can't see sound. So, so but you're, you're going back to the five-year-old Ruth and doing, right. you know, doing your absolutely. research and then teaching her. You're absolutely right. Wow, that was a breakthrough. That was a breakthrough. Thank you. So that that's kind of where I'm coming from is um, 
just breaking down that that barrier that some people feel that science is for other people, science is for smart people, science is for people who have a certain kind of, of a brain or a certain kind of an, a mind. And I just want to say that's that's not the case. Science is for everybody because it affects all of us. And the more that you can relate it to kids' everyday experiences, it becomes more meaningful and it becomes more accessible that way. That's incredible. And, and that maybe that explains where why the, the last thing that I want to write for kids is science. Right. <laughs> I left a career as a scientist so I can write fiction for kids. And I could probably write STEM for kids, but my heart isn't in it. Then you shouldn't. No, I, I, so of course I don't, except for yeah. one book. Um, yeah. And even that's a crazy book. Um, and so I, I, that's really, so we write to educate the four or five year old within us what we, what we were missing as a kid. That's that's fascinating. Uh, no one has ever drawn that conclusion for me before. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'd like to meet up with you another time, just the two of us, and talk about the stuff we don't have time for today. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and our trips, because I was a successful scientist, mm -hmm. and I left that to become a less successful writer. Um, <laughs> so. I'm also a musician and I love music and I love show tunes and you promised me another tune. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm like, for some reason, I'm like just drawing a blank. I Give usually ask people about the Beatles. Well, see, I was prepared for that. <laughs> I know. I was prepared for that. Okay. You know, here, listen. Yeah. They're going to take that off my uh, off the show. So. Okay. So I want are you going to sing Twist and Shout now? Yes, that was the song that I had for you. Okay. That you know. Like three seconds. You can have three seconds of a of a music, can't you? Ich weiß nicht. <laughs> they're they're really they're really difficult these days. Okay. Um, All right. So Ruth, for the first yeah. time. Yes. Of all the 120 people, nobody has sung "Twist and Shout." Uh, no, really. Yeah, and it's not an original Beatles song. It isn't. <laughs> no, but you're gonna. It's now an original cover by Ruth Burns. Okay. Go for it. Shake it up, baby. Shake it up, baby. Twist and shout, twist and shout. Come on, come on, come on, baby. Come on, baby. Work it on out, work it on out. Do 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 do. How's that? Is that good? It's incredible. <laughs> so, so Ruth, um, thank you so much for being on. You've got Mel. Um, it's been 48 minutes that went by in a flash. Wow. And uh, wow, keep on writing books. I will. Don't never go back to selling shoes. I will. And well, I can close with a, one of my favorite quotes that I've been using a lot from Fiddler on the Roof. At the very beginning, when Tevya is dragging himself and his horse home at the end of the day, and he talks about how busy he is. And he says, I am blessed with work. And that is how I feel about my career right now. It's truly been a blessing to be able to, to share my books with kids. And also whenever I have uh, deadlines or things like, you know, I'm trying to manage things. I just remind myself, I am blessed with work. A blessing on your head, mazel tov, mazel tov. <laughs> Exactly. Ruth, this has been incredible. Everybody run out and buy Ruth's new books when they're launched. <laughs> Thank they're, you. They're wonderful. And uh, it was so awesome meeting you. Can't wait to meet you in person, but yes. let's yeah. schedule another tete a tete, whatever Absolutely. that means. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.